Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone who's here tonight and welcome you to the NOSB's Ask an Expert webinar. My name is Melissa Brodeur and I'm the program manager for the NOSB. Um, we're happy to host this webinar tonight. The purpose is to give our NOSB students and educators, as well as any other interested attendees, um, the opportunity to ask their questions of our experts tonight on topics related to marine renewable energy. We're really pleased to partner with the employees at the U.S. Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory this evening, especially as NREL is one of our 2019 NOSB sponsors. So let me first start off by thanking NREL for their support of the NOSB students this year. Our experts tonight are at the forefront of current and future developments in wave and tidal energy along the U.S. coast, obviously something that our NOSB students are studying every year as they prepare for their competitions. And they're here to tell you about some of those developments that they work on, and they're also gonna share some of their career pathways and answer any of the questions that you may have on those topics. So um, this is your opportunity. Be sure to ask away and put their collective expertise to use. This is really your opportunity this evening. I'm gonna let the experts introduce themselves in a second, but first, um, I just wanted to go through a few logistical points on um, how the evening is going to go. Um, I have all the participants muted just so that the speakers are not going to be interrupted by barking dogs or you on your computers or your cell phones going off. Um, so we're gonna keep you all muted for the evening. But in order to ask your questions, there is a chat box in Zoom, and that's where we're gonna want you to type in your questions. So you can type them in at any point in time during the presentation. On my end, I will be monitoring them. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the experts um, introduce themselves, talk a little bit, talk about their careers. And when it comes to the Q&A session at the very end, I will read the questions aloud to them so that they can answer them for you. So like I said, make use of that chat box and your questions. This is your opportunity. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our experts so that they can introduce themselves and get started tonight. So let's see, I'm gonna make you a host again and you can begin. Great, just to confirm it, you can see our screen, our PowerPoint presentation front page? Yes. Yep. Great. So I guess I can start. So welcome everyone. Thank you for taking your time today to listen to us give a presentation on the U.S. marine energy development. My name is Nathan Tom and I'm a staff researcher here at the National Renewable Energy Laboratories and be one of our one of the presenters today. And I'm Elise DeGeorge, and I also work here at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'll be on the panel after uh, Nathan gives the presentation to talk about our, uh, our career, one of our career paths. Um, I'm Liz McMaster, and I'm here to answer any questions you guys have on career paths. And I'm Michelle Sosi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at NREL, and I will also be on the career path. And, and Hoyt, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and then kick off? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. So uh, my name is Hoyt Batty. Uh, I'm a program manager at the U.S. Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office. And so we are the, the part of the U.S. Department of Energy that funds a lot of the work on marine energy R&D at, at the National Renewable Energy Lab and at other U.S. national laboratories and universities and with a number of private companies across the country. Um, and so I'm a thrilled to to be with everyone tonight. Really excited by this. Um, we'll give a, an unprompted plug for N NOSB. Um, have been involved in and have followed the program for years, and I'm a big big fan. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm just going to give a little bit of uh, high level context about our organization, how we relate to the work that um, that NREL and a number of other people do around the country. Um, also wanted to give a chance for, for my colleague, Allison Johnson, to introduce herself um, and, uh, and just let everybody know, unfortunately, I'm at home tonight with a number of, <laughs> number of young children, so Allison might be fielding some of the questions if they're directed at me towards the, the end of the presentation of the panel. Allison, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. This is uh, Allison Johnson, also with the Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office. Um, I've worked for DOE for about three years, um, a little over three years, um, and have also spent some time working 
um, at EPA and um, internationally. But uh, really happy to be with all of you. Um, I focus on outreach and engagement activities specific to DOE's water power research portfolio. Um, and that includes a lot of um, the work that we're kind of starting this year to develop um, some new resources uh, for educators and um, just broader STEM materials. But, so thanks everyone. Awesome, thanks. Um, uh, so Nate, I think I can just ask you to advance the slides uh, for me. I'm not actually logged into the webinar, but yeah, if you, if you move on to slide two. Um, just a little high level information about uh, our, our part, our little tiny part of the Department of Energy. So uh, basically the Water Power Technologies Office focuses on, on two different um, types of technology research. Uh, up, up and coming marine energy, so wave, tidal, ocean current technologies, uh, but also conventional hydropower or, or pump storage technologies as well. On the whole, the office's resources are split about two thirds towards marine energy research and one third towards more conventional hydropower research. Um, and, and we really uh, think about or talk about the type of work we do in, in terms of three different um, types of activities. Um, early, very early stage research, um, uh, think looking at materials, different controls, technologies, really the fundamental scientific building blocks that allow other researchers or technology developers um, to continue making progress, increasing efficiency, reducing costs of these technologies. We also support efforts to test and validate individual technologies, so those that, that private companies or in some cases universities have worked to develop um, to ensure the, the reliability, to collect data on their performance, and to help um, kind of advance the state of the art of the science, um, which is really important for the emerging marine energy industry because it is still a relatively young industry. There's not huge amounts of data or lots of testing experience, especially out in open water. Um, and so those, uh, those efforts and sharing that data are really important. And so that kind of leads into the third area, we uh, view ourselves as an objective aggregator, analyzer, and disseminator of lots of different types of technical information, both on, as I was saying, the performance of technologies, but also other types of information. So information about potential uh, environmental or ecological interactions of technologies with their environments, um, uh, and lots of other um, types of information about supply chains, manufacturing, uh, opportunities for jobs, um, lots of things that people are interested in as a young industry continues to develop. Um, and so in, in this year, um, one of our big priorities that um, Nathan and some of the other folks from NREL are gonna talk about later on in the presentation, um, one of our new priorities is something, um, and it's gonna be uh, kind of well encapsulated in a new report that we're gonna be putting out soon called Powering the Blue Economy. Um, I think most people have probably heard that ter term, but the blue economy um, is just the kind of the umbrella term uh, to encapsulate all of the different things um, that humans do out in the ocean from scientific research to, you know, shipping to aquaculture to, you know, mineral minerals devel development. Um, and so that is the blue economy. And the, the fact is that lots of different blue economy industries have needs for and limitations on their ability to get access to energy. And so marine renewable energy might make a lot of sense for a lot of existing or potential future ocean industries or, or other maritime markets um, in terms of helping to solve some of their problems. So um, with that, I'll move on to the, the next slide. Um, this is really just a, a short and simplified kind of history of our MHK, that stands for Marine Hydrokinetic um, R&D at the department. As I mentioned, this is still a relatively young industry and a relatively young effort or program within the Department of Energy. Um, it was only in, in 2008 and really into 2009 that a sustained R&D program was initiated and spun up. Um, uh, back then, I started work at, at DOE in 2009. Um, you know, the, the annual budget that we had for marine energy research was really just about uh, 30 or 40 million dollars a year. I know that that sounds like a lot of money. It certainly did to me at the time. Um, but uh, it, it it's surprising how how far or maybe not how far um, that money goes when you're talking about relatively large, expensive, in some cases, in water deployments of big pieces of technology. Um, 
since then, we've um, made a lot of advances. We've uh, conducted national resource assessments for wave energy, tidal energy, ocean current, river current energy. Uh, we've supported a lot of first of their kind demonstration projects, a lot of that foundational work to develop models, the codes, the materials, and to help develop, continue to develop some of the experience around these technologies um, to continue to drive down their costs, increase their performance. Um, in the last couple of years, we ran a very successful prize competition called the Wave Energy Prize, um, where a number of different teams that all competed to test small scale wave energy devices were successful in, in doubling and actually quintupling um, the energy capture um, for, for devices at their, their small scales above and beyond what the state of the art was at the time. And then just recently, we began a pretty large project out um, in Oregon to develop the country's first uh, fully grid-connected, multi-berth open ocean test facility in an area that has got really, really significant wave energy resources for any of those, those of you who've been out to the coast of Oregon. Um, and so that's another big step forward uh, for the country in terms of developing um, marine energy technologies. And then um, just uh, the last slide that I'll, I'll talk to here um, is just a different type of uh, information work that we do. It's not all technology and engineering related. Um, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> nor are a lot of folks on our staff. Um, so as I was mentioning a couple of slides ago, we also do a lot of work to aggregate relevant information for the industry. And so the U.S. and, and our office, in partnership with another one of our national labs, um, actually manage a, a project that's been going for almost 10 years now as well, um, uh, an international effort where we've partnered with more than a dozen other countries to help collect, analyze, and disseminate information about potential environmental effects of marine energy technologies um, from all around the world. So there's research um, on marine energy technologies going on in well more than two dozen countries around the world. And all of those R&D efforts are generating data, um, some that are extremely useful in assessing whether or not uh, these technologies um, at small scales or at larger scales might have um, impacts on their environment that need to be considered. Um, I'll, I'll preface that by saying that most of the data that's been generated to date, and these all get, all these data get summarized in these massive international reports every few years, um, they're called state of the science reports. Um, but all indications thus far are that marine energy is relatively low impact and does not have many large or significant impacts, at least that we've been able to measure or identify to date. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any. You always have to approach things um, with the precautionary principle in mind. But really, we're trying to make sure that if the industry advances, that we're also addressing um, any concerns, any relevant, I mean, very, very rational concerns that people have about putting more things out in the ocean. Um, uh, but ultimately, the, the objective of developing these technologies is to do so to help address some of the potential issues um, related to climate change or the kind of the motivation for developing clean energy. Um, and, and ultimately, that's really what some of the long-term benefits from these uh, could be, in addition to some of the, the near-term opportunities for helping to solve challenges for other, um, other marine industries. So... Uh, with that, that's a little bit of high-level context. Um, I'll, I'll put myself on mute now and turn it back over to the team at NREL. Thanks, White. Appreciate that overview on DOE support of NREL and the marine hydrokinetic industry as a whole. So yeah, we're, I'll start and talk a little bit more on the kind of engineering side and model development. So to start off, as we mentioned, the marine hydrokinetic research, uh, we have a wave and tidal and tidal current. And so to make sure that we're clear when we're talking through the rest of the presentation, when we talk about wave energy, we are looking to exploit the kinetic and potential energy of surface waves. And these are the waves that you'll see if you're standing on the beach and you'll see the waves that are coming in to the coast. And these waves are generally generated by offshore wind that uh, creates friction against the sea surface and this, these been waves are allowed to propagate. And we usually characterize them as waves that have a period between five to roughly 20 seconds. And so we're gonna have multiple oscillations or periods over any given day. Then if we wanna move to talking about tidal or current energy, we are looking at 
the flow that is generated from the tides as that is the result of the bulges in the water content based on the, gra the gravitational pull from the sun and the moon. And this is something that is more on the cycle of about half a day. And generally, these devices are seeing more of a constant current or flow, a little bit more similar to wind turbines. And so they're trying to extract energy in a different physical way. So they're using different physics to extract energy from the system. And sometimes tidal waves are confused, uh, or it's a misnomer. And with the large waves that come and you see from disaster movies, but we normally characterize those or call those as tsunamis. And these are still water waves, but what happens is you have some large disturbance in the water, such as earthquakes or landslides, and that ends up causing a really large clump of water to first be pushed up into the air, and then gravity then splits that and causes these basically single large gravity waves then travel really long distances and that's why you can have earthquakes in the middle of the ocean end up creating uh, tidal waves that will come and hit the east, uh, sorry, the west coast of the United States. So one thing we want to ask is why is the Department of Energy interested in marine hydrokinetics? And it comes down to first our resource. So in the past, NREL and other national laboratories have looked at what the potential is and where the greatest potential is along the United States coast. So you can see on the left-hand side that of ocean, tidal, and ocean current, you can see that ocean wave has the largest potential along the United States coast. And the top places that we would expect to see devices be put in place is Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska and some of the Pacific Islands. Uh, part of that is from the fact that they have the largest wave energy resource is on the west, uh, the upper west coast, so Oregon, Washington, and Alaska, and some of the more island nations because the cost of energy there is already really high. Some of these islands have to fly in diesel, which is very expensive in itself, so these are places that we can penetrate the market and have wave energy make an impact sooner than later. And then I will mention when we are trying to characterize these resources, on the bottom of your screen, we have an equation uh, with PW, and that's how we calculate the power in the waves. And you'll see that the power in a wave is roughly proportional to the amplitude squared. So if you have a wave that's twice as large, you're actually getting four times as much energy. And it also is linearly proportional to the period of the wave. Uh, and so if you are increasing the period of your wave, you will have a little bit more energy in that wave to extract. And then if we want to look at the tidal resource, the tidal is the second most, uh, the largest second resource along our coast. Uh, but we do see that where the largest potential is, it's in actually the northeast, mostly. We do have some locations in Alaska, but we do see more locations off of Maine and Massachusetts and also in Washington. But you can see that a lot of the resource is still concentrated kind of in the northern states. And if we wanted to look at ocean current, which is the smallest of the three, most of the energy that we can probably collect is mostly off of Florida, as you can see from the picture on the bottom right. That's where the largest current in the United States is and where our engineers think you actually will be able to collect enough energy to be economical when you're thinking about the cost of energy. And then when we were calculating these resources, you can see from the equation on the bottom PT that the power contained within tidal or current energy is going to be proportional to the velocity of that flow cubic. And so that's how you can see that. Again, if you double the velocity of the fluid that's moving through your device, you can actually get three, uh, up to eight times more power. And so right now we have a lot of help from the DOE as well as US companies trying to spur innovation. So we still don't have a leader in the field, but we have a lot of different developers in the United States and in the world. So if you wanna look at the middle of your screen, if you look at the number of companies in the world that are researching and trying to develop marine energies, energy devices, the U.S. makes up about a third of all companies or startups. 
whereas the rest of uh, Europe accounts for about 50% and the rest of the world accounts for about 20%. And then in, in the United States, we have about 80% of the companies are looking at WAVE, while about only 20% is looking at TIDAL. And that is, again, thinking back to our resource calculation, there's a lot more potential of WAVE energy in the United States. However, both technologies will still play an important role, um, but you can just see that there's a lot more emphasis right now on wave energy development. And similar to what Hoyt had said earlier, you know, the wave energy prize was a great opportunity to get a lot of young startup companies. We had 92 teams enter the prize, and in the end, we the winners Aqua Harmonics uh, were are is a company that was a two-person startup that were from two students that had just recently graduated from the undergraduate and had just lived off the Oregon coast and decided to make a prototype. You can see it on the top middle point, it's the black kind of sphere, and they had some of their first prototypes, they just took it out into the ocean with their wetsuits and tested it in the water. So what's really this is trying to highlight is that we have a lot of really great opportunities for young researchers and young students to come in and make a big impact on this industry. And also the fact that this is still a pretty international effort. It's not just ourselves in the United States pushing these technologies. We have people from all over the world. The International Energy Commission is a joint task force that is hoping to make standards and set make a set of rules so that if you make your device in the United States, if you were to make it in Japan or then make it in Portugal, regardless, it would be made to a safe and reliable manner. And so that any place you want to deploy these, they would work efficiently and be able to produce power for the public to use. And so again, the energy community is working to move forward as a global entity rather than just a single nation. One of the cool things also about wave energy is that unlike wind energy, where the horizontal three-bladed turbine is pretty much the standard uh, wave energy, we don't have a, a tip or a typical design that we go to when we think of it. And what I've shown here is four different classifications for wave energy converters that we generally kind of put any design out or put it in a bin. And the first one is on the left hand side which consists mostly of a single buoy that moves up and down in heave we call those point absorbers those generally are pretty small relative to the wavelength and we have a picture on the bottom that is from the power buoy that is developed by ocean power technologies a u.s company and that is one method you can collect energy another is a second picture where we call this an attenuator and we have links that now are, rather than just being moved by the single peak of a wave, you can see that these links follow this fine sinuous little shape of the wave and the relative motion between the joints is what you're able to extract energy from. And the picture that we have below that is an example of a device called the Palamis that was deployed off the coast of Portugal. The next common device classification is the oscillated water column. And this one can be either fixed near shore or it could be floating. But what we are doing here is that we have a chamber, half of it is filled with water, half of it is roughly filled with air. And then as the waves come and hit the structure, causes the water level to rise and fall. And that will push and pull the air through a turbine. And we are able to extract energy through that. And the picture we have there is the ocean energy buoy, which has previously been deployed off of Ireland and in the near future will be deployed off of Hawaii. And then another concept that is currently being investigated is the overtopping device. And here we are trying to design the whole shape such that the waves will come and actually break or fall into a reservoir and then we can use similar technologies to hydropower where you have a constant flow that goes through this reservoir and produces power. 
And an example is the wave dragon. And the, you can see the arms on the side are specific to try and channel the waves to focus in the middle where you'll have its reservoir. And this device was tested off the coast of Denmark. And just to further emphasize the fact that we have a ton of different designs currently that are in the United States, both in Tidal and Wave Energy, just shows that we have a lot of startups, a lot of research that still needs to be done to find the either single device or several different devices that might help push us to make this industry commercial. And in order to give you kind of a size too, um, some of our full-scale devices, they can be really large. And that is what Hoyt pointed out earlier, is that 34 million seems like a lot of funding, but these devices, which can be a couple stories high in terms of just their single PTO unit, you can imagine that the cost of a single one of these prototypes can be on the orders of millions. So we have to be very smart in how we are investing our money as uh, we can't make too many mistakes moving forward such a large investment in these devices. And then also for, to highlight some of the marine current and tidal energy devices that are being pursued in the United States. The picture in the middle left, this is the Verdant Powers turbine. And it has been previously deployed in the East River in New York City. And I believe this is one of the first projects that got through the FERC process. So they went through a process to ensure that they would be able to sell their power to the city of New York. In the top right, we have one of the marine current turbines that Florida Atlantic University is hoping to develop or continue development and deploy off the coast of Florida. And these would be actually be floating current devices rather than being fixed to the seabed because where they are hoping to deploy these, the water depth is just too deep. So you need to find an alternative and have it being floating and operate, which poses its own unique challenges. And then on the bottom right, we have the Ocean Renewable Energy Corporation's cross-flow turbine. And they are also working on this device to work near shore or <coughs> also along rivers. And they currently have a project in Alaska to help support some remote communities as well. And so we have the whole range of commercial cities to small villages, and we're trying, we have developers working in all these fields. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about powering the blue economy. So a lot of the devices that we have, I have so far shown, has mostly focused on large scale utility power generation to supply our cities or villages, but we also see there is potential for having wave energy or tidal energy help to support the blue economy through different non-utility scale markets. And some of these markets can be broken down into power at sea, which we look at as considering ocean observation, underwater vehicle charging, marine aquaculture, marine algae for food or biofuels, as well as seawater mining. So we can think that we have a lot of autonomous underwater vehicles, we have navigational buoys, we have data buoys, and if we could have charging stations that are in the middle of the ocean that don't require any boats to go out and service, we could spend a lot of time helping to scan the ocean floors, look for new species, and help improve just the science of our oceans. And we think that's a very valuable tool that marine energy can provide. We also see benefits for helping to create resilient coastal communities. So we can have companies that rather than producing power, they're looking to produce fresh water. We can also use it to help with disaster recovery and resilience with potentially as global warming or climate change, we might have more severe weather and we would like potentially to use some of these devices to help mitigate the impacts that waves have on some of our coastal communities and also to help with isolated communities or island communities where, again, the cost of energy is really high. We're hoping that we can have some devices that will help power these remote communities and will help them out so they don't have to be burning some very dirty fuel also.
And one of the things we see, or one of the reasons why we see the blue economy as a really great option for marine energy is that in, by 2030, we expect the blue economy to double in the amount of money that is being put into it, going from about 1.3 trillion to, or 1.5 trillion to $3 trillion per year. And then we also have, which was mentioned earlier, uh, a current prize that is different than the wave energy prize. This is the waves of water prize, which is looking to find new ways to help bring wave power and combine it with desalinization. And if you have more details, I can let Hoyt and Allison talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we'll move on because we're running a little behind schedule. Um, and also, we wanted to highlight that just because wave energy, we're looking to produce maybe electrons, there are other devices and ways that we can use power in the ocean to help provide propulsion, such as wave powered boats that are shown on the bottom right. Whereas the waves pass by, you can have a set of springs that basically cause these orange flaps to kick similar to whale and dolphin fins and have these power boats as they go across the ocean. And if you weren't familiar, but global shipping accounts for 90% of our world's trade and it contributes up to about 2.2% of global carbon emissions. So we can see right away that we can have a pretty big impact on our daily lives by helping to incorporate renewable propulsion methods. You also have in the top right, a picture of a, the liquid robotics wave glider. And this uses wave power to drive this device to move slowly through the ocean, but it can be instrumented with different sensors to monitor salinity, ocean temperature, uh, anything you could fit on this device and not, uh, not provide too large of a power sink. But yeah, rather than producing power for existing buoys, you could have this that could actually move through the water as well. And then on the middle left, you have sail drone, which is an autonomous device that is being powered through the wind and solar. But you could also imagine that this could have another orientation or some type of gyroscopic device to be put inside. So in case there's cloud cover or no wind, this device could still get some power from the waves. And finally, since we know that a lot of uh, people on this call are current high school students, I wanted to highlight some of the offshore career opportunities for you to think about as you're potentially looking to go to college or post-college. And the main thing is that you know the marine hydrokinetic or marine energy sector requires a lot of different skill sets. We, of course, need engineers, scientists, but we still need people that can do financing, uh, safety, we have ships, so captains, workers on these ships. So there's a, a real wide range of stakeholders that will need to come together to help make this industry commercial and a larger part of our global economy. And there, if you're interested, there's a lot of opportunities now through professional societies. There are professional societies for renewable energy through INOR. You have professional societies for ship and naval architecture, and those look at ships to offshore oil platforms. We also need support for divers and other technical staff under the water. So being a, becoming a marine maritime professional technician, there's maritime training facilities. There's also specific academies that will give you a maritime specific degree, help you become uh, on the way to being a captain or uh, being an engineer on a ship, which can help deploy our devices or service our devices in the future. And there's also several different universities in the United States that currently have active programs in the marine energy field. And we'd be happy to answer any questions about these at the end. But other than that, we thank you for your time today and taking the time to listen to NREL and the DOE talk about our current efforts in the marine energy field. And we just hope that you see the exciting opportunities that this field has for young next generation students to come into this industry and really make a large impact in the near future. So thank you for your time and I uh, will answer any questions in a few moments. Yeah. We were gonna uh, move into a, just a, spend five, 10 minutes with a career panel here. Uh, we wanna go around the room 
And each person uh, in the room here is just going to talk about what they do and how they got there, why they do it, and what they like most about their jobs. And perhaps this will give you some ideas of some options available to you uh, to get into this field. Um, I can kick it off. Uh, I'm Elise DeGeorge, and I am a water power, the group manager in the water power group. I work primarily on projects that are around deploying or getting uh, past barriers to deployment of wind and water power uh, technology uh, deployment. Things uh, such as building the, uh, the workforce, getting people excited to go into this, uh, to new fields, renewable energy fields, and also uh, around uh, the mitigating impacts to wildlife. Those are primar primarily the projects that I work on. I spent most of my career in environmental consulting as an environmental engineer. Uh, and then came over to NREL due to its uh, its primary mission with uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. And I like it because I get to work with a, a lot of very uh, brilliant and passionate people that have uh, that are that believe in this overall mission of building a better world. And um, really, what I like most is um, contributing, getting more people excited about being part of this movement to uh, to do great things for the environment. Oh, um, hi, my name is Trent Dillon. Um, I'm a PhD student from the University of Washington. Uh, I'm currently completing a four-month internship here at NREL. Um, after I graduated uh, from undergrad with a degree in mechanical engineering, I knew I wanted to pursue graduate work in energy or sustainability. Uh, I found a lab at the University of Washington that was, uh, you know, really hardworking, uh, passionate people with a great uh, kind of uh, workplace environment and culture. Um, and I, I, I saw that their mission was kind of aligned with um, renewable energy and marine energy, and I wanted to pursue that. Um, my specific work here at the uh, at the National Renewable Energy Lab sort of revolves around what Nathan was talking about with the blue economy. Uh, I work on models that will predict the cost of a lot of uh, power solutions for the blue economy, so solar panels, uh, wind devices, uh, wave energy conversion, tidal energy conversion, and I also do work involving battery storage for such devices um, because. You know, the tides aren't always flowing, it's not always windy, it might not always be sunny. You need battery power uh, to bridge those gaps. Um, in terms of what I like most, I really like working in a kind of nascent and uh, up-and-coming field. Uh, it's really easy to kind of get to know people. Uh, people aren't afraid to take risks uh, in terms of uh, innovative strategies for achieving new goals. And I kind of like that energy that goes into uh, uh, the industry as a whole. Um. So next. Um, my name is Liz McMaster. I'm a research participant here at NREL, and I work with the marine hydrokinetic team on developing a new cost tool for industry and academia to have a good estimate of how much it costs to develop marine hydrokinetic technology. Um, and I got here at NREL, um, <laughs> well, I, in high school, I actually started doing research. I probably emailed about like 20 different professors and one replied and I started uh, volunteering at my local university and sort of a field I wasn't sure about um, just after school on Wednesdays and um, in college I tried to get involved in research and clubs and sort of develop a diverse background which led me to a couple internships which eventually gave me the experience to come here um, and I found my place sort of in renewable energy because I think that climate change is probably the biggest issue facing not only my generation but the rest of the world so um, yeah I really like working here because it feels like we're really making a difference and are making the lives better for everybody so yeah and it's nice to work with uh, like-minded people too as well so yeah all right <laughs> And this is Nathan again. So yeah, I ended up getting into marine renewable energy at the end of my undergraduate. I was graduating uh, with my undergrad in mechanical engineering as well and happened to stumble into an offshore class and that sparked my interest because it talked about wave energy. And at that time, I knew I wanted to get into some type of renewable energy, sustainable energy development. And then five years later, after getting my PhD, I ended up coming to NREL as a postdoc and I've been continuing to work in the wave energy design and control field for the last five years 
and so kind of stumbled into it but i really like the industry because as mentioned before it is very new we have are learning a lot every day a lot of the tools that we have for existing offshore structures uh, are great to start with but a lot of the technologies we are learn learning off of our ships and offshore platforms which unfortunately are never designed to move a lot and so we're having to try to change the theory and kind of create a new space for analysis just for marine energy and that's exciting because it's you don't get that in too many other current energy technologies. And so that's definitely what I like the most about being in the marine energy field. And this is Michelle Fogarty. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here in the Water Power Group, and I work on um, tidal energy resource characterization. So in those locations that Nathan mentioned earlier on the map, um, the place that you can extract tidal energy, the currents need to flow pretty quickly. And because there's friction with the bottom, that flow is pretty turbulent. You can think of it like gusty wind. And so my job is to use data that's collected in the field to be able to describe how gusty and turbulent that flow is so that people can build and test um, the turbines so they're strong enough but not too strong so that the, they are economical. Um, I got here. Um, this is career number two. My first career was as a science teacher for middle school and high school. And um, I got jealous of all the cool things my students were going to go do and decided that I wanted to go do science um, and do something with an applied um, focus. And that's probably why I do this. And, and what I like the most is the fact that I know that the research is being used to answer important questions and make good decisions. And it's wonderful to be around really smart, motivated people in an industry that's really new and, and we don't know all the answers. So there's discoveries that are um, unexpected and interesting all the time. Um, Allison Johnson. Yeah, hey guys, this is Allison. Um, as mentioned before, um, I work at DOE's headquarters with the Water Power Technologies Office. Um, so my role um, pretty much is uh, serving as a project manager. So we at headquarters uh, basically think about what is needed um, for the marine energy research field um, very broadly. And we try to create opportunities both in partnership with our national laboratories like um, my colleagues here from NREL um, as well as through competitive um, awards that are um, essentially grants, but we don't really call them grants. Uh, and we make those available to advance um, research in the field. Um, so I came to DOE uh, really because I had a background um, not in energy or engineering, but in political science. Um, I come from a family of public servants. My grandfather was actually um, a high school public teacher, a public high school teacher, and um, I was always interested in public service and government and, um, you know, the importance of, of good governance. And I was really interested in um, specifically DOE's renewable energy mission, um, basically just because I want to be a good steward of our planet. And I think that is, um, you know, a, a passion that a lot of people in the renewable energy field certainly share. And um, my role really, what I love about it so much is that as everyone's kind of mentioned, we work in a field that, you know, we're, we're really thinking about problems that the world um, is facing today, but also, you know, solutions to those problems and thinking about things that, you know, aren't even commercially available. We're working on technologies that um, might be a reality, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. So that's that's pretty cool and really exciting. Um, and I think there are a lot of things in the renewable energy field that uh, probably we all, you know, are, are here for. So um, primarily being a good uh, steward of our planet as well as taxpayer dollars and getting to work on some really interesting research. Thanks, Allison. Oh, new. Um, who am I talking to? Kids? Okay, you can do it. Hi, um, my name is Rebecca Green, 
and I'm um, I'm an oceanographer by background and uh, senior project leader here at NREL. And I work on a combination of both offshore wind projects and uh, marine renewable energy MHK projects. Um, in terms of how I got here, um, I've been very excited about oceanography from a young age um, and grew up as a scuba diver. And so after going to school in oceanography, I did a lot of um, analysis on how climate changes our oceans and thought it would be really great to uh, proactively get into renewable energy projects to um, help uh, help sort of slow down that, that change both to our climate and, and oceans. And um, what I like most about what I do here is that um, my colleagues are very passionate about uh, renewable energy, and we do a lot of great uh, research, research and development work. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Sanu, and uh, I work on offshore wind systems. I, um, I basically used to work in the oil and gas industry and used to design a lot of uh, uh, floating systems to, for oil production, and so, uh, I figured maybe after all these years uh, in oil and gas industry, maybe I should work in the clean energy for, for a change. So that's how I got here. So now I do the same thing, designing floating systems for offshore wind and marine hydrokinetics. Why do I do this? Uh, I think it's cool. You know, it's, uh, I think earlier someone said about being a good steward of the planet and doing something good for the planet. So that's part of the reason why I do this besides working and <laughs> paying my bills. But, uh, and what I like most about it is the people here are cool, you know, working on cool things. And, uh, you know, I really enjoy uh, doing design work and contributing to a greener planet. Hi, I'm Walt Musial. I've been at NREL for about 30 years. Um, I've been working in uh, wind energy uh, all my career and um, so I got into wind energy because uh, back in the 1970s there was a um, they started having um, panic about energy crisis in the in the country and there was a um, Arab oil embargo and people started looking for other uh, ways to make energy and at the time wind energy hadn't even really been invented yet but we got involved in it because it was exciting and there was a lot of new things to, to think about. And as an engineer, uh, studying engineering, you could study all different disciplines. It was electrical, it was mechanical, it was aerodynamics. And uh, it, it, so, I, um, so we were, got very, very excited about it. And then um, back, back, I moved to California to work on the first projects in California. And that took me um, quite a ways and I got a lot of experience working in the field and then I came to NREL and started working here and I've had a lot of different careers here we've, we've been work we worked on land-based turbines for a long time and uh, and then and we weren't really sure they were going to work but obviously they did and we became I, I, I developed the blade testing group here I, I developed I worked on uh, the unsteady aerodynamics experiment, where we learned about how wind turbine aerodynamics are different than airplanes and helicopters. And, uh, and then uh, about 15 years ago, I started working on offshore wind. And, uh, and so now I've been working on offshore wind for about 15 years, and, and we're starting to see the, the fruits of our labor happen with that because offshore wind's just starting now in, in the United States. So I guess what I like the most is working on things that. Um, that haven't been uh, invented yet, and in making them come to to life, and that's um, that's one of the cool things we do here. And everybody's really excited about doing that kind of thing, and and I um, I, I want to keep doing it. So. And uh, I think Hoyt, I'm not sure if you're able to uh, contribute right now, but it's Jar. Uh, yeah, in, in the spirit of uh, water, it's uh, it's bath time here at the Batty household. But yeah, I mean, I I think the only thing that I can add, um, in addition to everyone who's who's already talked about some of their, you know, amazing experiences and work, um, I am a a generalist at heart. I'm not an oceanographer or an engineer. 
or even a scientist, even though my background is in environmental science. Um, I, I really just pursued a passion for renewable energy. Uh, environmental sciences have always been interested in the ocean and natural systems, and somehow it led me to a career where I can, you know, work on projects uh, like what everybody's been talking about today um, that are contributing to a, you know, very lofty, high-level, long-term goal. Um, so I feel very, you know, honored and privileged to be able to do that. Um, but you don't need uh, to know exactly what you want to do. I didn't know what marine energy was until I started working in carbon energy. Um, so there are lots of paths and lots of ways that people can, can find their way into cool, interesting fields like this. Um, you don't always have to, you know, plan out your path there from the beginning. Um, sometimes it just takes, you know, kind of interest and, and, and passion, passion in something generally to, to, you know, kind of stumble your way into it. Great, thank you, Hoyt. I think we're, uh, we got everybody here. If you, uh, if we're ready to take some questions if you have some. Okay, well, thanks everyone for presenting. Um, I think you guys provided a really great overview of um, sort of the excitement of working in the field, uh, what's available, what's being used, the technology that's out there. And I really appreciate everybody talking about their careers. Um, especially mentioning that um, sometimes you end up in a career that you didn't necessarily uh, think you were going to get into. Um, one of the things we try to highlight to NOSB students is that the path to careers is not always a straight line. It's often a very curvy path. So um, I hope those that are on will um, consider you know, submitting a few questions through the chat box. Like I said, this is your opportunity to put all these experts' knowledge to use and answer your questions. Any any questions you have? Well, I will ask one. Um, if students were thinking that this was a topic um, that they were interested in, potentially as you know, future career what would be the starting point in terms of next steps? Um, as someone who is currently enrolled uh, in a university who kind of specializes in marine energy, I think that um, any high school student who's interested in, in working in the marine field, uh, you know, is, is excellently positioned to enter. You know, uh, there are labs across the country like Oregon State, Cal, um, I think UNH does work in tidal energy, University of Washington, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's an official kind of database or, or uh, list of universities that have laboratories, but they're out there, and I think there's about a dozen or so of them. Um, so if you're thinking about college applications, um, you know, going being an undergrad at one of those universities would be a huge advantage to, uh, to eventually working on these types of systems and problems. And if anyone's interested, you can reach you can reach out to us at NREL. We do have a kind of a small a list of universities that we know are active. So if, as Trent mentioned, if you're looking for a school to have programs, we can help you find one that might be in uh, an area you're looking to go. And I would add, not be afraid to reach out and email people. Most people are, are more than happy to have a conversation with you. So if you find somebody's contact name on, on a website, reach out and chances are they'll, they'll get back to you. Great, and I also appreciate that um, at least a few of you mentioned that there are a lot of ways to be involved in this. Um, you mentioned, you know, the sort of the business uh, section behind it as well. So um, I appreciate that you sort of brought that to the forefront too. Um, definitely always trying to tell students that they can have a job related to ocean science without having to worry be, about being out to sea for, you know, six months at a time. 
Okay, any other questions? I mean, we're coming up on the eight o'clock hour. Um, so if you have any questions, make sure you get them in now. Otherwise, I guess we'll just end the evening. Any last minute questions? Okay, well, um, let me once again thank everyone who participated from um, DOE and NREL this evening. Like I said, I think they gave you a great webinar um, providing you with some of the information about marine renewable energy, the science, uh, the technology that's currently being used, sort of where they're going in the future, and definitely this career aspect um, for those of you who are interested in it. Just so you know, uh, we have recorded this webinar, so we will be posting it to our YouTube um, channel tomorrow. So if there were any who, uh, you know, who weren't able to participate, um, let them know. We'll have it up on our website as well, and we'll get it out on social media so um, everyone can benefit from tonight's webinar. So um, thanks for joining us. And uh, if you are a team, I saw that there's ASNSA. <laughs> if there's a team on, thanks for participating. You never know when you're going to get these questions, so it's beneficial for you to, to participate. Um, okay, well, good night, everyone, and thanks again for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night.